My lecture this evening is drawn from an exhibition that I curated for the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco, where it appeared last year. And I'm really happy that it came to New York. I live here in New York City, so it was great to have it come to my hometown. It'll be here for some time, actually. It just opened a couple days ago. And then next year, it goes to the Jewish Museum in Philadelphia. So it'll have a, a nice three-city tour. And as it's been traveling, there's been considerable interest in other cities taking the show. So we hope it has a, a long life with New York being its first on-the-road stop. Um, the, the show and its accompanying book uh, highlights the role of Jewish architects and designers in the creation of a distinctly modern American domestic landscape in the middle decades of the 20th century. And one of the goals of the show, and people have asked why we picked certain designers and why we picked certain objects, was I wanted to show the impact of these designers on every aspect of the home, the full range of the domestic environment, from the large-scale subdivision, in some cases, to the single-family house, to the furnishings and the housewares within the house, to the logos on the packaging in our homes, and also, and this is equally important because of the propagandistic nature of modern design in those years, and I'll talk about this in a moment, the importance of the marketing and the press images, the creation of those exhibitions and photographs and books and brochures that broadcast this new modern home design across America. So it's not just what's in the home, but how it kind of reached the general public, the general consumer. Um, all of the architects and designers I'm going to be discussing operated with a, a network or a, a kind of a very interesting web of institutions. There were cultural, social, and educational institutions that in those years of the middle years of the 20th century fostered the inclusion of Jewish architects and designers in avant-garde circles. From the 30s through the 60s, the arena of modern architecture and design in particular offered an unprecedented flourishing of opportunities for Jewish architects and designers. And this is a major part of the story of the exhibition, how these institutions embraced Jewish architects and designers and made them part of the mainstream of American design. There were progressive schools with curricula devoted to art design and architecture. There were small artist colonies. There were museums, both big and small. And there were magazines that were architecturally and artistically adventurous and interested in the modern style. They all welcomed Jews as they valued talent, commitment, and an understanding and practice of modernism above religious or national affiliation. So there was a kind of egalitarianism and a broadly based embrace of peoples of different kinds in these avant-garde institutions. For most modern designers and their patrons connected with these progressive institutions, religion was oftentimes a non-issue. In fact, by 1961, and this is featured in the, this quote is featured in the exhibition, by 1961, in other words, 15 years after the end of the Second World War, or 16 years after the end of the war, Jewish architect Percival Goodman, who was very well known at the time for the modernist synagogues he designed it, many of which were in suburban areas to which Jews, like many Americans, were moving. And Goodman in 61, in the book that he wrote a major chapter on architecture for this book, he could assert that in post-World War II America, the centuries-old line dividing people by Jew and Gentile had been replaced by a new boundary. And that was a boundary between kind of a culturally advanced group of people and avant-garde and a rear-guard group of people. So in other words, he says the line in America, in post-war America, was now a stylistic dividing line more than it was a religious dividing line. It's a very optimistic idea, which can be argued with. But this is what was very much in the air, in, certainly in the careers of people like Goodman by 1961 in America. And he quotes, uh, or he, uh, his quote from this book is, avant-garde, Goodman notes, belongs neither to Gentile nor Jew, but is the plight of everybody who must rebel in order to breathe again, and in that number, there are a number of Jews. Now, tonight I'm going to focus on six specific organizations, and if you've seen the exhibition, you'll notice that when you come into it to your right is an animated graphic of the United States 
that shows the 30-some designers in the exhibition and how they relate to all of these institutions. So those six institutions are the Black Mountain College in North Carolina, the Museum of Modern Art here in New York, the Institute of Design, a school in Chicago, Minneapolis's Walker Art Center, and then two institutions in California, the Arts and Architecture Magazine, and a small artist colony, probably the least known of the entities I'm talking about, because it didn't last very long, it lasted about six or seven years. It's called Pond Farm, and it's lo it was located north of uh, San Francisco. Now, but before doing this, though, I want to characterize the designers I'm going to be talking about. The list includes both native and foreign-born Jewish designers and architects. Of the American-born, most were descended from families that had come to America in that great wave of immigrants of the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. They oftentimes settled in New York City, with its bustling Jewish shopping districts as seen here, Alongside, I find this interesting, a Yiddish ad for a popular Unita, Unita biscuit. The Unita biscuit was like a ubiquitous product at this particular time. And you'll see how it's, it's an advertisement in Yiddish that actually is for this national biscuit company, this popular biscuit company. Many of these people sought to leave behind the violent anti-Semitism of the old world and were eager to embrace the contemporary manners of the new world. Now, especially here in New York, what were those manners? They were the modernizing forces of commerce, of advertising, and of consumer culture, but also a widespread acceptance of an American culture of abundant material goods that was far different in its abundance from the, very different from the Jewish experience in old Europe. There's a great book that I used very much in, in organizing the exhibition and writing my own essay for the catalog by an historian named Andrew Hanza. And the book is called Adapting to Abundance. And in the book, he writes, if the American people has been characterized by a peculiar faith in the principle of a rising standard of living, then the adaptation of immigrants to the perspective of abundance must be considered an essential part of Americanization. As consumers, he continues, Jews sought important elements of American identity more quickly and more thoroughly than other groups of newcomers. One of the arguments Henza makes is because Jews who came here had no desire to go back to the old country and wanted to move forward and to Americanize quickly. He writes that as entrepreneurs in consumer-oriented trades, they more than others enrich the potent environment of urban consumption, which has become such a distinctive feature of American society. Now here, we see three designers whose parents come from this generation. They were especially focused on fashion and retailing, their parents' work, which was, of course, ideal backgrounds for the future work of their children as mid-century modern designers in the 1930s through the 1950s. On the left is Paul Rand. Rand went on to an influential career. He was born in 1914. He went on to an influential career in graphic design and advertising. He is best known as the designer who did the logo for IBM and for ABC and for UPS and for Westinghouse. But he started in advertising in the 1940s. And interestingly, he received his earliest training drawing the advertisements, the packaging, in his parents' Brooklyn grocery store. In fact, ran, <coughs> excuse me. In fact, Rand might have drawn that you need a biscuit package that I just showed. So he talks about this at the age of three, being attracted to the packaging and drawing it, trying to understand exactly how the graphic design of the packaging worked. And he goes on to become a well-known graphic designer. In the middle is Ben Sabel, whose boldly colored and patterned dinnerware added flair to the post-war table. Sabel's mother designed women's clothes and ran her own jewelry shop here in Manhattan. And finally, on the right is Brooklyn-born Alex Steinweiss. His stylish, long-playing records were a staple of the American post-war home. He's credited with actually the first person to design the covers of long-paying records. His family was in the fashion business. His father designed shoes. His mother was a seamstress. 
Now to this burgeoning homegrown modernist talent came another wave of architects and designers during the 1930s, Jews who fled Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. The most prominent of these designers came from the Bauhaus, the famous German design school founded by the architect Walter Gropius in 1919. Now the Bauhaus under Gropius's guidance sought to elevate the applied arts to the level of the fine arts and to integrate all the visual arts into a unified whole. So there's a desire on the part of the Bauhaus to bring good design to the masses and to take from the fine arts of painting and sculpture and to adapt those to the commercial arts. This is something which someone like Rand does in his advertising, Sabel does in the sort of biomorphic shapes of his dinnerware, but the Bauhaus was a major source of this inspiration. Now the Bauhaus attracted the attention of American critics as early as the 1920s. So it's formed in the 1919. By the 20s, the idea of the Bauhaus, this egalitarian, optimistic notion of design for industry, is talked about in America. It's being discussed. People are visiting it. There are small exhibitions about the Bauhaus in America. But of course, it's the National Socialist Party's closing of the Bauhaus in 1933 because they claimed it promoted a Bolshevik agenda in art and culture that forced many of its leaders to move to the United States, to emigrate here. And the United States is a great beneficiary of many people who studied at the Bauhaus, who taught at the Bauhaus, and who actually were influenced by it in Europe. Germany's leaders, after they closed the Bauhaus, would soon pass prescriptions against everything, the international, the modern, and the Jewish, spurring the exodus of many of these leading lights. Now, Joseph Albers and his wife, Annie, who we see here on the screen, who was of Jewish heritage, was the, they were the first Bauhauslers to come to America in 1933. And they took up faculty positions at Black Mountain College, which I just mentioned. It was a brand new arts college formed on the basis of the Bauhaus. The idea being that you would create fabrics that looked to modern painting that could be brought into the modern home. It also was a school that worked on the workshop model, another idea of the Bauhaus. In the Bauhaus, you didn't go to class. You had a foundation course, and then you worked in weaving, woodworking, ceramics. You worked actually in a workshop system, and the Black Mountain College adapted this idea. Black Mountain College didn't last very long, in its short 24-year history from 1933 to 57, however, it fostered an incredible artistic community that proved to be a major source in shaping American modernism. It was after the war that people like John Cage and Robert Rauschenberg were actually at, the, the, uh, at Black Mountain College. This was the early days when Annie Albers and Joseph Albers were there. Joseph Albers led the painting workshop at Black Mountain College, and Annie Albers led its textile workshop. And from her days at Black Mountain, she ranged across a wide spectrum. She would do traditional objects that are used in the home, such as weavings for upholstery, textiles for drapery fabrics. But she also began to develop one-of-a-kind objects that she almost saw as kind of textile paintings. So she saw these as works of art that were woven. Uh, other Bauhauslers followed the Albers to America. Among them we see on the left was the architect, well, we don't see on the left, was the architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, who was director of the Bauhaus from 30 to 1933 when the Nazis closed it. Gropius himself, as well as other designers of Jewish heritage, such as Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, seen here on the left. They all spread the influence of the Bauhaus across America transforming it to suit American capitalist conditions and circumstances as they took up influential positions, not only in academia, but also in various corporations. Far-sighted Chicagoans, for example, eager to vie with the kind of avant-garde credentials of New York in the 1930s, hired Mies in 1938 to head the architecture department at IIT, and they also hired Laszlo mahoney Naji to head what was called the New Bauhaus in 1937. Both men adapted Bauhaus teaching methods and the workshop system in the, in the schools in Chicago. Moholy Nagy, like Joseph Albers, had taught a master class at the Bauhaus. He had taught that preliminary design course. 
but he also brought the workshop system to Chicago. It was called the New Bauhaus in 37, and it is today's Institute of Design, located on the campus of the Illinois Institute of Technology. Jewish designers were key figures among his faculty. Marley Ehrman, who, like Maholi, fled Nazi Germany, became the director of the Institute's weaving workshop. So she was like Annie Albers, but in Chicago. She designed textiles for mass production and collaborated with architects like Mies and with Charles and Ray Eames and Aero Saarinen. In fact, in the early 40s at Cranbrook, the famous design school in Detroit, uh, Eames and Saarinen designed molded plywood furniture that was upholstered in Marley Ehrman fabrics. Ehrman actually, in addition to working at the workshop at Institute of Design, went on to open her own store in 1956 in Oak Park, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, called the Elm Shop. It featured her own handwoven textiles, which were often designed like this beautiful placemat done in very elegant geometric patterns. And you can see almost a kind of Mondrian-like quality being brought to something totally ordinary, the placemat that you'd put on your table. Another faculty member at the Institute of Design was Eugene Deutsch. He was born in Budapest in 1927, and he moved to Chicago with his brother, who ran a successful handcraft business in Chicago. He studied at the Art Institute, and by 1934 had established his own ceramics workshop. And very quickly, because of the abstract, sort of almost uh, surrealist dimension of his object, this is a tea service, uh, he was quickly hired and tapped by Maholi Naji to teach the ceramics workshop at the Institute of Design. The Bauhaus also influenced an art, a sort of a school cum artist colony called Pond Farm. I mentioned it earlier. It was founded in 1940 in Sonoma County, California by an architect, Gordon Hare, and his wife, Jane. Jane was a Jewish writer and heiress to a West Coast coffee fortune. With the world on the brink of disaster, this was 1940, the Hares caught, sought to create what they called a sustainable sanctuary for artists away from a world gone amok. And the school would teach handcrafts, again, very much based on the Bauhaus. But by this point, the Bauhaus had come to America in the form of the Institute of Design and Black Mountain College. So now the Bauhaus had been implanted in America and now there were Bauhaus-inspired American sources that other American institutions could draw upon. To launch their project, the Hares traveled all throughout Europe in the late 1930s, and they looked for three Bauhaus-inspired Jewish emigres as their first artists and teachers. They were the ceramicist, Marguerite Wildenhain, a weaver named Trudy Germontpré, and a metalsmith, Victor Rees. All were Jewish, all were desperate to escape Europe, and all came to California eventually where they founded the workshops at Pond Farm. Now, Pond Farm's existence was very brief. Uh, the Harris founded it in the early 40s. It didn't officially open until 1949, and it only lasted until 1952. Uh, it's been said that it was the victim of internal conflicts, each of the three designers, the craftspeople, were highly individualistic, and they simply didn't get along. And in a way, Pond Farm was a victim of its own success, bringing these innovative and very eccentric people together. They simply couldn't get along. However, all three stayed in the San Francisco area. And even to this day, there are ceramicists, woodworkers, metalsmiths, weavers who owe their reputation to these three people because throughout the 1950s and 60s, they taught all throughout the Bay Area and many of their students are still working today. The faculty also established themselves as artists in their own right. Marguerite Wildenhain, seen here, entered the Bauhaus after World War I, where she remained for seven years. From 27 to 50, 1933, she taught at the Municipal School of Arts and Crafts in Germany and she worked for another factory, a porcelain factory in Berlin. In 33, as the Nazis gained power, Wildenhain left Germany and eventually immigrated to the United States in 1940, where she was tapped by the Hares. Another designer was Trudy Germontpré. She was a commercial art, art, textile and rug designer, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, a very prominent design teacher. 
Interestingly, Guillermo and Prey's parents had come to the United States in the 1930s, and they became teacher at Black Mountain College. So you're starting to see here that this network is not just one-to-one -one people involved in it, but actually sometimes a person is involved in two or three of these institutions at the same time. It becomes a kind of self-reinforcing global network that's working in the United States. She was then invited, Trudy Guillermo and Prey, to teach at Black Mountain College by the Elbers in the late 1940s. And a few years later, she then moved on to Pond Farm, where she worked for many years. This is a beautiful textile she designed, like Annie Albers. She did commercial products, but she also did wall hangings that were sculptures of and in themselves. So this is a characteristic that Annie Albers <clears throat> brings to the United States, and a lot of the people are in, who work with her and are inspired by her actually create domestic objects for the home, but also works of art that are woven sculptures. The third of the Pond Farm trio was a man named Victor Rees. He was born in Germany, and he did not go to the Bauhaus, but he was influenced by Bauhaus design principles as the Bauhaus becomes increasingly influential. In 1933, Rees emigrated to Palestine, where he collaborated with the architect Eric Mendelssohn on decorative objects for his architectural commissions, and he taught metalsmithing in Palestine. During the 40s, he moved to, North to Northern California and to Palm Farm, he designed jewelry, decorative objects in Judaica, such as this mezuzah we see in a highly original, very sculptural form. Speaking for this group of designers who in America would pursue careers as individuals freed from the collective yoke that Adolf Hitler's Germany had imposed on Jews, Ries proudly proclaimed, we did not talk about the war at Pond Farm. What for? We were not Jews at Pond Farm, we were artists. So again, these designers feel that America provides them a freedom to pursue their religious beliefs free of their professional ideas or their professional identity. Now, while these two new schools, Pond Farm, which was both an artist colony and a school, and Black Mountain College introduced progressive Bauhaus teaching methods to the United States, the Bauhaus achieved an unprecedented level of acceptance among American elite when one of the newest one of the oldest, sorry, and most prestigious institutions, Harvard University, hired Gropius. So Mies van der Rohe, the architect, went to the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, but Gropius went to uh, Harvard University. Harvard, as it turned out, being much more established than the Illinois Institute of Technology, refused to accept the workshop system that IIT and Black Mountain College and Pond Farm developed, or the Institute of Design. Harvard did not accept that idea. It did, however, bring Gropius in, and with Gropius came a wide range of major, major architects and designers, including seen here, Marcel Breuer, who comes and works with Gropius at uh, Harvard University, and who teaches people like Paul Rudolph and Philip Johnson. So the pedagogic impact of the Bauhaus is very, very considerable. Uh, initially, when Breuer came, Breuer was of Jewish descent, Initially, when Breuer came, he designed furniture, which is in the exhibition, wood plywood furniture, plywood furniture for Bryn Mawr, Unif Bryn Mawr College. But no institution had the kind of cultural prestige and the financial backing and the kind of Manhattan media-centric quality as the Museum of Modern Art. MoMA was founded in 1929 and early on knew about the Bauhaus. It did more than any other institution to strengthen the Bauhaus influence in America and to increase the role of Jewish architects and designers in modernism in America. MoMA did this through a wide range of projects. They did it through programs of exhibitions and books that featured the work of Bauhaus people. It was considered by the museum the Bauhaus itself is the epicenter of modernism in art, architecture, and design. The Bauhaus projects and people were featured in exhibitions throughout the 1930s, but in 1938, MoMA decided to mount a show devoted to the school. It was called Bauhaus 1919-1928. We see the cover of the book here. It featured the work of more than 100 artists, architects, and designers associated with the school. The show explored all aspects of the Bauhaus with a strong emphasis on products for the home 
including furniture, textiles, and ceramics. MoMA's promotion of the Bauhaus was not without controversy. And there are very interesting letters in the archive of the Museum of Modern Art that I was able to find in doing the research for this show. Shortly after the exhibition opened in 1938, the museum's founding director, Alfred H. Barr, Jr., wrote a letter to, ba to Gropius. Gropius, who had founded the Bauhaus, was actually supervising the exhibition and the book for the Museum of Modern Art from Cambridge, where he was, of course, teaching at Harvard. Barr wrote to Gropius, as we could have guessed, we have already heard report that the exhibition is considered Jewish. Many Americans are so ignorant of European names that they conclude, because the Nazi government has been against the Bauhaus, the names Gropius, Bayer, Maholinaj are probably Jewish communists. This was a very dark anti-Semitic moment in American history when there was a feeling that Jews were communists and that they were going to get us involved in the war. And this was an ugly, ugly moment in American life. And that's what I think uh, Barr is referring to by this term, Jewish communists. Seeking to characterize the Nazi response to modernism as purely aesthetic, and this was MoMA's goal, to rip it away from its political or any kind of other kinds of context to make it aesthetic, Barr, in his letter to Gropius, actually proposed placing an exhibition plaque in the exhibition stating, quote, architecturally, the Bauhaus under Gropius and Mies van der Rohe was deliberately non-political in character. Its radical innovations were confined entirely to the field of art and education. It should be stated that although the Bauhaus welcomed Jewish students, there were no Jews on its faculties. And then he actually says to Gropius in the letter, let me know how many Jews were on the faculty, and I'm going to put that number down in the, in the label. Needless to say, Gropius' response was quick and firm. He tells him, we're not doing this. We're absolutely not going to do this. It's an oddest set of letters that Barr thought this would be a, a good idea. In its emphasis on modernism as a style, and this is very significant, in its emphasis on modernism as a style, MoMA in many ways helps decouple modernism from any kind of broader political or social connotations as the Jewish communist notion he mentions in the letter. This, I believe, is an essential condition for the wider acceptance of modernism in America by corporate leaders as well as the middle class homeowner. After the war, with this in mind, MoMA continued to promote modernism by focusing on products for the home. They did one-person exhibitions showcasing the work of a number of Jewish designers. They did shows on Annie Albers, window curtains and upholstery fabric. They did shows with Ava Zeisel, the great ceramicist, which we, an example of her work we see here. Zeisel was born into a highly assimilated Jewish family in Hungary. And MoMA actually worked with her and her dinnerware manufacturer, Castled in China, to create a line of beautiful porcelain dinnerware called Museum. So they not only showed her work, they commissioned her to do work for them. Graphics were a very important part of MoMA's modern identity, and they worked with such Jewish designers as Leo Leone. Leone had escaped fascist Italy around 1940. He came to work with Fortune magazine in America, and for MoMA did this beautiful brochure for an automobile exhibition they did in the early 1950s. They also hired graphic designer George Cherney, who had escaped from Germany and also worked for the Herman Miller Company in Zeeland, Michigan, as well as for the Museum of Modern Art, designing the cover for the Textiles USA catalog, a big show they did on textiles in the mid 1950s the work of a number of Jewish designers were also featured in an exhibition MoMA did called Modern Art in Your Life. It was a 1949 show that goes to the heart of the Bauhaus idea, that you can, it would say to the general public who came to see the exhibition, you can walk down the street, you can buy products for your home that show the inspiration of Russian constructivism, that show the inspiration for uh, contemporary abstract art that show the inspiration for surrealism, of surrealism, you can buy these objects for your home. The cover of the book is designed by Paul Rand, who I mentioned earlier, and it's a very interesting cover. You'll notice what he's done is it's a dinnerware place setting, but the dish is actually an artist's palette. So it really gets the idea 
of the artist's palette becomes the dinner where it's art in your life. It's really visually a very compelling image. At the same time, Alex Steinweiss, who I mentioned earlier, his record covers were featured in the exhibition. Now, while these exhibitions represented significant efforts in MoMA's campaign to promote modernism to a broad public, they were single events, these specific exhibitions. But there were two other programs that went on for many years. The first was the creation of a series of modern homes, full-scale houses, actually built in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art. The first was the architect Marcel Breuer, was picked by the architect Philip, then the curator, then later the architect Philip Johnson, to design a home fully furnished to try to convince the returning veteran to go modern. At the same time, MoMA did a series of what were called good design shows, which were promoted uh, of products that were created. Breuer's house in the late 1940s, early 50s, was followed the next year by one designed by Jewish architect Gregory Ain. Ain had moved to Los Angeles from Pittsburgh to attend architecture school during the 1920s, and he eventually worked in LA for the Jewish architects Rudolf Schindler and Richard Neutra, who had emigrated in the 20s to come to America to take advantage of the great economic advantage here in the United States. And they moved quickly to California, a city much more open in many ways than New York because it was a new kind of territory. These projects by Ain attracted the attention of MoMA curator Philip Johnson, who commissioned Ain to design the museum's second house in the garden, which we see here. Here, in fact, we see Ain and Johnson in the MoMA house. Johnson is one of the most uh, problematic figures in this entire story. He was the director of architecture and industrial design at the Museum of Modern Art. He was their first curator of architecture, and he was a champion of modernism. In fact, it was Johnson who recommended to Black Mountain College that they hire Joseph and Annie Albers. Johnson's progressive position, however, in the arena of modern design, did not apply to his political activities in the mid to late 1930s. He leaves the Museum of Modern Art in the 1930s to pursue a political career, and he becomes very closely allied with an anti-Semitic Catholic priest named Father Coughlin, who was a vile radio commentator, who actually, it's through Coughlin that you get these commun Jewish communist cabal ideas, and Johnson actually works with him. How Johnson could promote the work of Jewish designers, befriend Jewish people, and yet be so politically anti-Semitic is one of the most severe examples of cognitive dissonance I've ever heard. <laughs> Interestingly, a designer like George Nelson, uh, who's an American-born designer, shows the kind of more positive dimension of being Jewish in America in the post-war period and having Jewishness be your religion but not necessarily your professional identity. Nelson was an editor, author of a popular book called Tomorrow's House and a Teacher. He was embraced by progressive cultural institutions as well as blue chip corporations like Herman Miller Furniture Company. He started his own design firm in 1947 while working as Herman Miller's design director. And Nelson and his firm designed sofas, benches, storage units, lamps, and clocks. More than any other designer, he was ubiquitous across the modernist design uh, field. He worked with many, many designers of Jewish descent, Irving Harper, who is known to have designed the so-called marshmallow sofa. George Cherney worked for him. Ernest Farmer worked for him, another furniture designer. Now, both Nelson and Johnson were involved in another MoMA project, the Good Design Program. The Good Design Program was the brainchild of Edgar Kaufman, Jr. Kaufman, Jr.'s father was the head of Kaufman Department Store in Pittsburgh. And he is the man who commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to build Falling Water. And he's also the man who commissioned Richard Neutra to design the Kaufman Desert House in Palm Springs, California. Kaufman came up with the idea of holding a series of exhibitions where every product which MoMA thought was a good design would have one of these small little square labels. The shows were very commercially driven. They were very propagandistic. They opened in the Merchandise Mart in Chicago and then came to the Museum of Modern Art or vice versa. 
So they were shown both in a commercial entity, the Mart in Chicago, and then at MoMA. And this is something which Kaufman certainly got from his father's background in very stylish retailing. The Good Design shows featured a wide range of products. There was dinnerware for Ben Sabel that I mentioned earlier, which is seen on top, and the work of another Jewish designer, Aaron Sohn, who had fled Germany in the mid-1930s. So again, this great wave of designers who comes in the 1930s is influenced. Their work is shown and represented in the Good Design program. Also included in the program was the work of Henry Dreyfus, best known for the Honeywell thermostat, and there was also whimsical wallpaper designed by Saul Steinberg, better known as an illustrator, but, and this featured in the exhibition, was an illustrator as well as a wallpaper designer and a fabric designer. He had come from Italy at this time. Now, like MoMA, Minneapolis's Walker Art Center presented a demonstration house, a series of demonstration houses. We in New York like to think everything starts here. It actually didn't. Frankly, the idea of building modern demonstration houses was first done at the Minneapolis Walker Art Institute in 1941, and MoMA was very aware of this. So this is another one of these great progressive institutions. The 41 Idea House, as it was called, was well received. It was visited by something like 50,000 people. But then after the war, the Walker decided to go one step further and do a fully modernist house. The original one was a little bit modern, a little bit traditional. The later version in 1947, uh, was called Idea House 2. It includes lots of modernist products by people like George Nelson. There is tableware by Eva Zeisel. But it was developed by a different group of people. The original director was still there. But there was a new group of people, two people in particular, who had just moved to Minneapolis from New York. One is a woman named Hilda Reese and an architect named William Friedman. They had met in New York in the 1930s while teaching at the Design Laboratory. The Design Laboratory was a WPA-sponsored project like Black Mountain College that was very Bauhaus-inspired in its curriculum. Reese, Hilda Reese had a very interesting connection directed to the Bauhaus. She had studied with Mies van der Rohe, graduated in around 1932, and then immigrated to New York, and then soon moves on to Minneapolis. Reese, like Edgar Kaufman Jr., also edited a magazine and did a series of exhibitions. She had a magazine called the Everyday Art Quarterly, a guide to well-designed products, which was available by subscription for about 15 cents, which was today about $2. Under Reese's Everyday Art Gallery and her quarterly, you had the work of various designers we've already seen now being shown in the Midwest. You had people like Marguerite Wildenhain featured at the Walker. There were articles by Edgar Kaufman Jr. There were profiles of Maholi Naj and his Institute of Design in Chicago. Even after Reese left the Walker in 1950 for California, where she opened up her modern shop in Northern California, the Walker Art Center continued to have a very inclusive approach to design. An article in the 1953 issue of the uh, Quarterly featured the work of various textile designers. Many of them were Jewish designers. There was Marley Ehrman from Chicago, who we've already met, fellow Chicagoan uh, Ben Rose. And seen here, Ruth Adler Schnee. Uh, Ruth Adler Schnee is still alive. She is working with Knoll International. She came to the opening of the exhibition. She emigrated from Germany in 1938. And uh, she told us at the opening that a, a year ago, she was asked by Knoll of the famous furniture company to do textiles for them. They wanted her to sign a 20-year contract. And she said, do you know I'm 92? And they said, yes, but let's see what happens. So. <laughs> she also came to the opening with this most spectacular crocheted dress. It was really a remarkable garment. Uh, this approach, in many ways, this inclusive approach aligned the Walker with progressive cultural and social trends that included the assimilation of Jews into the American mainstream. In turn, assimilation was a symptom of broader cultural shifts affecting the United States. In the aftermath of World War II, the hub of world Jewry shifted from Europe to America. 
President Harry Truman acknowledged the state of Israel, and anti-Semitism was more broadly and publicly decried in metropolitan centers. There were, anti, there were movies about anti-Semitism, and it's being more and more talked about as America tries to move away from its uglier history of the 1930s and early 40s. Two reformed Jewish leaders actually go so far as to say that in post-war America, Jews were, quote, this is a great quote because it's classic sort of 1940s rhetoric, Jews were jet propelled from the periphery of American life, an immigrant low-income and battle defensive group to a rising middle-class status in a community of highly educated, mobile, culturally advanced, predominantly native-born Americans. Now, why these post-war American Jewish architects and designers should embrace modernism was widely discussed by practitioners and critics and religious leaders in post-World War II America. In the sphere of religious architecture and decoration, for example, influential members of the Reform Judaism movement succeeded in encouraging Jewish congregations to hire modern architects such as Eric Mendelssohn for new synagogues, as seen here on the left, Mendelssohn was in fact quoted at the time as saying that adopting modern architecture made Jews, quote, full participants in this momentous period of American history. So this is the beginning of that post-war period that ends in many ways and culminates with that Percival Goodman quote that I started off talking about. Also a few years later, in 1956, New York's Jewish Museum established a workshop to create Jewish ceremonial objects in a modern style, primarily for the home. The feeling was if there are people, if people are living in modern homes with modern furnishings, they should have modern Judaic objects. This was a, a, a workshop that they created for many years. It was initially uh, under the direction of a man named Ludwig Wolpert, whose beautiful candelabra we see above. And then he was succeeded by his disciple, Moshe Zabari. Now this is the last of our six entities, our last of the six organizations. While the Walker and MoMA developed full-scale temporary demonstration houses, the avant-garde magazine Arts and Architecture in Los Angeles went one step further. They actually commissioned the construction of approximately 36 new full-scale houses people would live in. The idea was that you would become a case study house program, as the project was called, you would become a case study house if you agreed to sort of have your house be judged as being worthy of considered modern, but also if you let the general public pass through it on certain weekends so that it could be used as a demonstration house and as a kind of promotional tool. The program was under the auspices of a man named John Intenza. He had purchased a magazine called California Arts and Architecture in 1938. And in the early 1940s, he took off the name California to give it a more international flair. Here we see him with the American designers, Charles and Ray Eames. Arts and Architecture launched its so-called Case Study House program in 1945 with the purpose of promoting modern domestic architecture to American homeowners. They built these prototypical homes. Examples of that kind of home would be the work of Richard Neutra. This is the Kaufman Desert House on the left, and a house by Rodolf, uh, uh, Soriano, uh, sorry, Rafael Soriano, a Greek-born uh, Sephardic Jew who emigrated to the United States in 1924 and who apprenticed with Richard Neutra in Los Angeles. Now, while the Case Study House program primarily focused on single-family homes, it also experimented with large-scale residential developments. This is an example given by Case Study House number 24, which was created in 1961 and was never built. It would have been a 260 home suburban tract with a community owned park and a recreational center. It was being developed by the Jewish marketer and developer, Joseph Eichler, a Northern California developer who also built in Southern California. Eichler bucked tradition and societal norms in many ways. His houses were not in the sort of reigning colonial revival style, but had open plans and glass walls, as you see here. He even uh, uh, developed a kind of prototypical kitchen for a new house of the future. He also bucked societal trends. 
And in many ways, he was very against anti-Semitic ideas that were reigning still in America at the time. He purposely quit from the Home Builders Association in the mid-1950s because they did not support his ideas of having non-restrictive housing policies. They still had restrictive housing policies. He was against that, and he actually quit. He's one of the few people who actually puts his money where his mouth is and actually supports social advanced ideas and not just aesthetic advanced ideas. In addition to sponsoring modernist residential architecture, arts and architecture, like the Good Design Program and like Hilda Reese's project, also featured in its pages the latest developments in modern home furnishings. In its pages, you could learn about the work of Gertrude and Otto Natzler, who were talented Jewish emigres who created ceramics together throughout a 30-some year of career. To sell the idea of modern home design to the public, arts and architecture also employed talented photographers and graphic designers, many of whom were Jewish. These designers included Alvin Lustig, who we see here, who reformatted the magazine, redesigned its masthead, and created its new logo, and its, true, truly abstract, its first truly abstract cover for the February 1942 issue. Here we see Alvin Lustig with his wife, Elaine Lustig Cohen, who was actually at the opening and happily had herself photographed with her daughter in front of this image in the exhibition. Saul Bass was another Jewish designer but arts and architecture, designing this 1948 cover. And of course, he goes on to become the father of title credits in America. Finally, in the hands of artists like Julius Shulman, photography became an important vehicle for bringing case study houses and California modernism to the national public. Shulman, seen here on the left, and in this photograph, he's with the great architect Richard Neutra. He was born in Brooklyn. And he moves with his family first to Connecticut, then to Los Angeles, where he spends his adolescence and falls in love with modern design in the 1930s. He falls in love with it at that time. He actually procures fellow Jewish architects commissions throughout the Los Angeles area and then becomes a well-known photographer. He becomes, in many ways, the official photographer for California Arts and Architecture magazine. Shulman's 1960 photograph of the uh, Pierre Koenig's case study house number two, a kind of steel and glass box that's dramatically cantilevered from the Hollywood Hills, is completed in 62, and it remains without a doubt the era's most technocratic and optimistic expression of living in a modern manner. By the middle decades of the 20th century, Jews like Shulman, born in America within families of immigrants, many of whom had entered through Ellis Island, had themselves passed through what were, in effect, aesthetic Ellis Islands. Art and Architecture Magazine, the Museum of Modern Art, the Walker Art Center, and the lesser known Pond Farm and Black Mountain College and the Institute of Design all served as these kinds of portals, these kinds of aesthetic Ellis Islands. Through them, Jewish architects and designers, both American and foreign born, entered the mainstream of American architecture and design and in turn, entered the mainstream of American life itself. Thank you. So I think. We have um, time for about. There should be time for questions? About two. <laughs> two questions? About two, two or three. Two, three, all right. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. I do. Um, you said that this modern design was made for people right. to be affordable for people, but were many of the uh, items that we saw, were they mass produced? Yes. Yeah, you'll find, for instance, you know, some are still made. So, for example, the molded plywood chairs that Charles and Ray Eames did are still made. Uh, the, the fiberglass chairs that they created are still made. Uh, the marshmallow sofa, I think, is a specialty item that I don't think many people would ever buy. It's kind of a one-off. Uh, Aero Saarinen's furniture is all still made. Uh, the, the pedestal tables. Oftentimes, they were a bit more expensive than they hoped they would be. And as Ruth Adler Schnee pointed out, we're almost experiencing more a modern moment now than they were in the 1950s. It was the public resisted the modern movement in many ways. And where people really encountered them was less in the home than in high schools, high school auditoriums, church auditoriums. That's really where they encountered it. 
By the 70s and 80s, there was a kind of a greater interest in this area. Now, of course, with the Mad Men phenomenon, it's kind of a rage. But it's become increasingly more popular now. But there was a resistance to it. It was, however, inexpensive in its day. In addition to the many Jews who, of course, you're talking about here, were there a lot of non-Jews who also were extremely important in promulgating modernism? Yes, of course. Yeah, definitely, without a doubt. Yeah, it, it's, I'm not arguing that it's a Jewish phenomenon alone, but what's interesting is it's the embrace of many Jewish designers and the proportion of Jewish designers within the movement that is interesting. Jews made up something like 3% of the population at the time, and yet if you, it's obviously anecdotal, you can't really quantify it, but the impact is very, very large. And I think one of the reasons is because in, when they came to America, they wanted to get away from historical architecture and history. They wanted to move into the American mainstream. And certainly because of the war and because of the Nazi regime and the fascist regime, as Jews come here to escape Europe, they bring these modernist ideas with them from the Bauhaus. So there's a kind of a, there's a social and a cultural dimension more than there is a religious dimension. And there is a desire after the war, as I said, to kind of make America more of a, the American ideal of a level playing field. We're very far from it, but there's an ideal, especially after the war. Okay, was there, you had so I get the sense that the dominant figures of the modernist movement in the, in the mid-century were Jewish? Or many were, many yes. Were. Many, and many were. Who would you say their heirs are today? I mean, are they you know, much more of, of mixed? Um, I think ever or? since, the, well, I think what happens is ever since the Second World War, Jewish architects and designers are just part of the mainstream. Frank Gehry's Jewish, Richard Meyer, Robert Stern, I think we don't see them anymore. We don't see this as an unusual phenomenon anymore. They're part of the mainstream, and that becoming part of the mainstream occurs in this pivotal sort of the run-up of the 1930s, and then in the post-war period, they enter that mainstream and are now part of it. So we don't, they become invisible in many ways. Not invisible, but their Jewishness has become unimportant. part of this uh, need to embrace modernism? Or? I think in some, it depends on the individual. I mean, George Nelson was Jewish, but never. I talked to people who worked with him for many years, and they never really talked about it. Because again, they were in a, a more elite, progressive circle where the difference between nationalities and religious groups was less significant. They were social, they were artistically progressive, and they were ideally socially progressive. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you.